Hi, I'm Jeff Madoff, and I'm here with Dan Sullivan, and we're here to talk about anything and everything. Today, we're going to start exploring how do you value yourself? How do you know what to charge? And that's a challenge that a lot of entrepreneurs have, whether they're selling a product or a service. So Dan, I want to kick it over to you in terms of how do you establish what to charge and how do you know what is either going to get the job or overcome the fear that you might lose it if you ask too much? Yeah, I think pricing is really a crucial part of actually the creative process because, you know, whether it's a product or a service or in your case, the project that Babs and I are involved with you, we've asked to tag along with your Broadway play you're creating an experience, an entertainment experience, okay? And in the Broadway terms, there's a pricing mechanism of, you know, what a customer off the street pays to see a play in that, but really the pricing mechanism for what you're doing started right back at the beginning, and that was to actually interest investors in actually being part of the process while well, you're you're selling something when you ask investors to put their money into it so there's a pricing mechanism and the one thing you know i've read a lot of the historical economics on pricing and it's pretty clear that pricing is completely subjective it's strictly what's in the mind of the person paying what the value is so there isn't a fixed price for anything it's subjective. The person who's asking to be paid something is subjective on their part because they're basing it on some value they want to create. And the person who would be the check writer, I know you have some very young students at the new school. Sometimes I have to explain what a check is. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. But a check, you know, someone writes something that's good at the bank. And so there's a subjective quality about it. So that's where I'll start off because I've dealt with entrepreneurs for going on almost 50 years now. For the most part, I believe that really good entrepreneurs are underpriced. They underprice themselves and that really bad entrepreneurs overprice themselves. And the reason is that really good entrepreneurs are passionate about what they're creating, but they're not passionate about the value proposition for someone who's going to pay for it. And people who are overpriced believe that their product, their service, their credentials, who they represent in the marketplace, and what the marketplace is kind of enthusiastic about right now, they're basing their pricing on that, but it still doesn't have anything to do with what's going on in the mind of the would-be purchaser. So that raises a bunch of interesting questions because an entrepreneur who is doing a startup, you know, they want to enter into the marketplace, they want to sell the goods or the service or whatever. And what they need to know is sort of what's the competitive landscape to a degree and what are the given circumstances in the world they're trying to sell into. You know, so how important do you think context is in determining pricing? Well, I think it's half the story, in other words, but never more than half, okay? And what I mean by that, you're obviously creating something that doesn't have to be too broadly explained in the marketplace. And I remember in the 1970s when I started coaching, the biggest obstacle for me for the first 10 years wasn't to explain what I did as a profession. It was actually to explain what coaching was because coaching wasn't known in the context that we're using it now. Okay, I mean, there was coaching in the entertainment world. There was coaching in all forms of entertainment and arts, and there was coaching in sports. But coaching in the business world, that wasn't a well-known thing. So when you talked about yourself being a coach to entrepreneurs, it wasn't like you had to explain how you were a better coach than other people. You had to explain, you know, what coaching was in this context because it was largely a management world, not a coaching world. So I think that that is context and it pays to really be able to identify people who would already be interested in what it is that you're offering. 
I mean, what do you find? I mean, sometimes I think with young entrepreneurs, people who are in their late teens, or early 20s, I find that they've fallen in love with some sort of activity that they would like to get paid for by other people rather than have a job working for someone else. They would like to get paid for what it is that they would love to do. I mean, I'm just asking a question there. Well, I think one thing is that's critical is establishing a proof of concept, you know, because in order for something to have value, you can't be the only one that values it (laughs) if you're trying to sell it to somebody else. (laughs) You know, you at least got to find one other sucker out there, right? (laughs) You know, so there can be a transaction. It makes me think back with my dad. There was a piece of property he was interested in back in Akron, Ohio. This is many years ago. And I happened to be with my dad when he met with this real estate agent. And I loved my dad's answer. The guy said to my dad, this is worth, you know, X amount of money. And my dad's response was, to who? And that sort of stopped the guy cold. And he goes, what do you mean? He said, well, you haven't sold it yet. (laughs) So you obviously haven't found the right person yet that thinks it's worth what you think it's worth. Yeah. And so my dad made him an offer. And he said, no, no, that's, it's worth more than that. Hmm. And then my dad said, okay, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> you know, good luck with that. <laughs> About 10 months later, he called my dad back and he said, Ralph, I'll give you that property for what your offer was. And my dad said, well, that offer is no longer any good. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy said, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? And he said, it's 10 months later. You haven't sold it. It's not worth what you thought it was. Mm -hmm. Here's how much I'll give you. Then the guy said, well, it was worth more than that. He said, well, then take another 10 months and see who we can find that's going to agree with you because Mm -hmm. here's what I'm offering. And he ended up selling it to my dad. Yeah. Well, you've just done an autopsy on every every <laughs> offer that's ever been made since. That's right. You know, we don't know what the original Apple deal was in the Garden of Eden, but there was probably some negotiation there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you've just laid bare what the marketplace issue is. And my feeling is, unless you start there and work backwards towards how this would be good for you, I don't think you really know that much about being an entrepreneur. No, I think that's true. And, you know, one of the things that I do in my class is I'll go over to one of the students and I'll pick up a bottle of water. I said, how much did you pay for this? And she said a dollar. And I said, where'd you get it? She said, at the convenience store on the corner. I said, okay, would anybody pay $5 for this? And everybody shakes their head, no. I said, what about $10? Did you pay that? Oh, no. And there's laughter and so on. I said, okay, we're going to change the context a little bit. You're in the desert. And the only thing that is keeping you from dying is this bottle of water. And I'm the heartless guy selling it. And I want, because I know you have it, I want 5,000 bucks for it. Is it worth it if it'll save your life? Yeah. And so it changes the whole discussion, right? And so I think the context is huge. Mm -hmm. And in the marketplace, you can put it out there, but you're going to find out pretty quickly, is somebody going to pay that or not? Because you can think you're worth whatever you think, but if nobody's willing to pay it, you know, then it's pointless. To give you an example, I was at a social event. I don't know how we got onto the topic, but we were discussing salaries for athletes. And just recently in the news, some baseball player had gotten like a 15-year contract at roughly about 30 million a year for 15 years. And so it was about $450 million. And there was a person who was outraged by this in the conversation. She said, that's pathetic. That's pathetic. There's nobody who's worth $450 million. And I said, well, of course there is. (laughs) Somebody just gave the person a guaranteed contract for 15 years. Well, it's absurd. And I said, well, the person who is the check writer here is a billionaire, okay? And I don't think he got to be a billionaire without knowing what it was worth paying things for. And she said, well, it's obscene that a person should get that much money. And I said, well, it's not about morality here. It's simply that the person has talents 
The other person wants those talents. They negotiated, obviously. It was a process of negotiation. But I said, you know, I, I actually know the ratio that they determined the price was, and it's the ratio that for baseball was the same in 1950 as it is 70 years later. And that is the amount of salary that a baseball club can pay for all its players is a percentage of the total market value of the baseball club. In other words, if the billionaire owner were to sell the baseball club, he would get this price. And what he's paying this athlete is a percentage of that. And it's no different. They know the ratios. Okay. And because this athlete is getting this contract, other players on the team can get a much smaller contract because they have to fit it within the ratio. And she said, well, there's school teachers who make only $45,000 a year. And I said, well, that's what they're worth. Uh, well, I mean, if you thought I had her on baseball, baseball players, you should have seen what happened. Oh, I can't imagine. I said, no, they negotiate. It's a negotiation. Okay. Yeah, but think of the value. I said, it's not part of the negotiation. The value is this person wants to work for a year. I would like to have a salary for that amount of money. It's $45,000. Maybe in another school district, it's different. Maybe taking a chance on her own out in the marketplace, teaching what she teaches. Maybe she could get 50 parents and she will teach their children and she'll set a price, maybe $100,000 to teach their parents. But it's all a question of the context that the income is being negotiated in. So you're absolutely right. And every context is unique. Right. And the thing about, you know, what's interesting is, so you talk about teacher salaries, that becomes a trigger point, but it's not really a trigger point the way you're talking about it. That's just, you know, for better or for worse, that's the price range yeah. that that person is able to get in that area. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with what you or I may think the importance of a good teacher is the value of a good teacher or whatever. That world, the given circumstances don't have those kinds of paychecks. And, you know, athletes are very much like you know, entertainers, if you're Tom Cruise or Tom Hanks or whoever, and you can sell tickets, then, you know, you're going to know what your value is because you can point to a ledger sheet yeah. of I've appeared in these and there's what they've grossed and this is what I want. Yeah. And then it becomes a value calculation. Well, you've had a process going, which is still in the works now, of filling the complete cast, front stage and backstage, the complete mm -hmm. cast play and play. And every negotiation is individual. There isn't a set negotiation for how much anybody pays. Each of them has to be talked through. Each of them is comparing the commitment of their time to your project in comparison with other projects they could do or other opportunities. Right. And the thing is, the context is always specific. The context is always unique of what can be paid for. Yeah. And the thing with theater is it becomes a choice of other opportunities because in a Lort theater of a certain seating, there are constrictions on salaries. Mm -hmm. When you get to a Broadway or you're doing a tour, it becomes another thing. So people do know what world they're navigating in, yeah. but you are correct because it is then the choice of opportunity. Well, I have this offer in New York as opposed to this offer in a regional theater. And New York is gonna pay me five times as much. I'm just pulling numbers. Yeah. And so it becomes a choice of opportunities and what do you value yourself? And it's not just what you value yourself at, it's how much do you wanna do it? Do you think that you know this particular play or playing on this particular team is going to be more fulfilling and up your profile and even lead to a greater salary the next thing as a result of what you've done with that thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Jeff, you've been involved in the video world, in the, you know, packaging world for many, many decades, really. I was just going to ask you that when people talk about signing a contract or signing a salary, the first thing that comes to their mind is money, but there are a lot of other dimensions to why someone would sign a contract to be part of a project besides money. And as a matter of fact, I had a 
union negotiator for 40 years. He was a negotiator for management with the union. So this was private sector. And we were talking one day about the difficulty when it gets down to money when the union will sign a contract on part of its of its employees or the management will sign a contract on behalf of the company. And he said, you know, I've kept track of this over about 30 years. And he said, if you compare what's being discussed right before the contract is signed, where the negotiation began, he said that Money moves up. He said, my experience is that money is around number six when union negotiations begin. And there's a lot of other issues people have. They have time issues that they want to discuss. They have flexibility issues. They have participation issues. Then they have things like benefits issues. And he says the reason why money negotiations are really painful is because there's been no agreement on anything else. And the only thing left is money. Well, I think that's a great point because money is not the sole motivator. I mean, for some people it is. But in most cases, for instance, in the theater world, you want that person's passion to be enlisted in the project. And frankly, you know, in my production company, I had almost no turnover because I tried and strove to create an environment that I would want to work in, which means tremendous flexibility, respect, and allowing a person to exercise and grow with their talents. So where the average turnover is like every two years or so, I had people that were with me 20 years and more. And it's because I created a playground. Yeah. And it wasn't, you know, my way or the highway. And I actually liked it when there would be differences of opinion and politely, but you would defend your work Mm -hmm. because I wanted you to care about what you were doing. And if it was just about the paycheck, there's an incentive not to rock the boat. Yeah. The other thing is that you're in an interesting spot right now. And I don't know if Broadway has a previous precedent for what you're going through, the theater world in New York and the thing, because it was closed down for, you know, I think it just opened, right? In September, did it open? Yeah. It's opened in, well, the Bruce Springsteen play opened first, but that's a one-man show. And then a show called Passover opened in early August. Yeah. But that was a, I don't think that you have a historical precedent. This was unique. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You mean the circumstances as a result of COVID? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's absolutely unique. So to a certain extent, you know, all the Monopoly pieces have gone back in the box. You know, it's a new game. It's a new theater world. And, you know, what people did before COVID and what was true before COVID as far as negotiations and contracts and money available, nobody knows because they don't know how the public is responding. I suspect the public's going to respond as well as regulations will allow them to respond. I think the theaters will be filled. But everybody's, to a certain extent, starting new. It's kind of like a startup industry right now. Yeah, the circumstances are novel, you know, to what they had been in the past. That's correct. Early indications are, and this is as recently as this past week, when two other shows opened, Waitress and... I'm blanking on the other one, but the initial ticket sales were really strong. Even opening earlier than that, Springsteen sold out his entire run. Mm -hmm. By the way, it goes back to context and value, but because Springsteen's play was very popular when he was doing his run, then of course there was this 15, 16 month interruption with COVID and there was scarcity Mm -hmm. in terms of tickets. And so I had friends who were trying to get tickets and they were saying, I'm not paying $4,500 for a ticket to see the play as much as I'd like to see him. But there are people that it was worth paying that much to. Yeah. You know, you asked me when we started our podcast today, you were talking about abundance, you know, it reminded me of something I said to Peter Diamandis, because those is, uh, I think, probably a superb technological scout and 
sort of uh, reporter from the front stage of, you know, the front lines of breakthrough technologies. Anyway, I've had a collaborative project with Peter, strategic coach in Peter's company called Abundance 360. And we named it for two reasons. It was sort of like a, every year it was a 360 degree view of technology. And then the other thing is about, you know, the number of days in the year, 365. So it was sort of got a sense that you could combine two meanings in one package. But when we got to 360, in terms of the number of people who could attend, we capped it. And there were people who said, you know, I'll pay double for it. And we said, no, it's going to be 360 people. You know, we'll have 360. And Peter says, you know, what about this? I mean, there's like 50 others. I said, Peter, there's nothing that sells abundance like scarcity. That's <laughs> exactly right. And that's true in the art world. It's true if you're trying to scalp tickets, you know, or buy them. Doing water on the corner at the that's corner right. store or in the desert. That's right. That's right. Uh, and that that's an issue that you, is there an abundance of what you're selling out there? Right. Okay, that tells you what your bargaining position is. That's right. And I, I want to go into that a little deeper, but I want to go back to something first. And that is, so for those entrepreneurs out there who are looking how to price themselves to begin to get a foothold in what they believe is a viable market, what is the criteria and what would you suggest for them to look at when they're trying to figure out what their pricing should be so they can make that entree into the market? Yeah, and this to me is the hardest step that any entrepreneur can make. And that is, you can't see what you're offering from your point of view, okay? Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that, your point of view is, so-and-so is doing this and I'm doing this and I'm different for so-and-so. That's from your point of view. In other words, that you're doing a self-comparison between what you're doing and what a competitor would doing. But, in all the thinking that you do about that, not once are either of you actually thinking what's going on in the side of the customer, the potential customer. And my feeling is that you have to put your, whatever your offering is, whatever your creative is, that you have to risk that it's really not important to someone else and go out and find out. You have to go out mm -hmm. and actually say, I've got this and it does this and does this. And, you know, it's on the back of a napkin. You're having a coffee and you say, you know, if you do it this way, you can save time, you can save money, you can save steps, whatever it is, and find out whether the person's actually interested in your idea. Okay. And one of the things that I have a strict rule on is I never test on anyone except check writers. So when I get a new idea, I don't ask my staff about it. I don't ask anything about it. You know, I, I go out there and I say, I'm thinking of this new thing and this is how it works. And everything that's weak about my presentation will come out in that conversation. <laughs> you are established enough to know who to go to for that. Yeah. But, you know, when someone is starting off, it's always this balance of, I don't want to undersell myself or undervalue myself. But I also don't want to scare off potential business that could help me gain traction. Well, you can't undersell your value because there is no value. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You remind me, by the way, of my great grandfather, which, you know, he would buy way back when, would buy like a dozen pair of socks for a dollar, and then he'd sell them for 75 cents. And he would sell out every week. <laughs> and my grandmother said, you know, how do you expect to make money doing business that way? And he said, volume. <laughs> you know? But, uh, I know I lose on every transaction, but I'll make it up with volume. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. But what I mean by this is that you're ahead of the game. In other words, let's take personality, the name of your play. Okay. Somewhere between meeting Lloyd Price and doing the interview with him, the documentary interview that got this started, learning his story, an idea occurred to you. You know, I got something going here. I got a terrific life. This is a historical bridge. This individual almost single-handedly is a bridge from one genre of music to an entirely new genre of music that happened in the early 1950s. Hardly anything known about him. And yet, 
if you go back to people who were alive at that time, people who were in business, he was a major, major character. And he's got a great story and he's got great music. And somewhere along the idea, you had to say, you know, I think this will make a great musical, you know, and living where you live, you would naturally think of New York as a place to do this. So take me back to when the idea started to form. Well, for me, you know, meeting Lloyd and interviewing him for that documentary and doing research about him, I found him to be such a charismatic individual. And you met him and talked to him, you know, yep. he's got an energy about him that's unique. And a story that I thought was really important to tell. And ultimately, I'm seduced by ideas. So I didn't even really know how to budget a Broadway show. So I knew I had to get a general manager to put together budgets. I mean, budgeting a theatrical enterprise, because you don't start off on Broadway, and hopefully we will get there. But you don't start off that way. So, you know, I didn't even know the steps. So I entered into this business, kind of a blank slate, although I knew it related to production and the kind of production I was doing, but there's different titles for the ledger items, but I understood that. And, you know, I said to Lloyd, I know I can capture your voice. His excitement about the first few scenes that I wrote acted as fuel for me. And the more research I did, the more excited I became. I didn't know how I was going to turn this into what has become, but I knew that I could learn how to turn it into what it has become by applying myself and dealing with all the early rejections that I got. But I was actually relatively early, I got people interested in the play. Yeah. Well, I just want to back up a little bit. There's two sales before you actually talk to anyone. First of all, you had to sell yourself on it. That's right. Okay. And then you had to sell Lloyd on it. By the way, I just used that in my class last week, you know, your double sale idea, which I think is so great because it's so true. One of my guilty pleasures is I'll watch Pawn Stars. Okay. You ever seen that show? It's fun. You know, it's Pawn Shop, right? Yeah. And, you know, you can tell really early on who is going to get a better price and who isn't and who's going to cave in or who's prepared to walk away. And, you know, if you don't have confidence in what you're selling, you know, it's like, well, you know, I'd like to get, you've already lost the negotiation. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So then it becomes, I've never told you this before, but it becomes about when I sold my first design business, actually my second design business, when I sold that, I was dealing with a huge white shoe law firm that was representing the company that was buying my company. And their CFO kept doing percentages. And I put percentages out there for what I wanted and percentage of this and percentage of sales and growth and all this. So knee jerk, he cuts my percentages in half. And I said, okay, I accept. And he looks at me and I said, let's move on. I accept. And so he thought for that moment that he cut me in half and he had the better of the deal. I knew what kind of schmuck he was. <laughs> you know? So to him, in his mind, just cutting in half meant that he got the advantage. Well, the next day he said, you know, I ran the numbers. I said, yeah. Well, we can't afford to pay you. I said, well, you agreed to it. He said, well, I didn't realize, you know, I didn't realize how those percentages played out. And I said, that's your problem. You know, that's how they played out. You know, you thought somehow you bested me because you were so excited just trying to cut my legs off that you didn't even look at the context of the numbers. You just thought cutting me in half, that gave you a better deal. So, you know, it was really interesting in establishing value so much in negotiation is knowing the psychology of the person you're negotiating with. Yeah. And so when you give in on things, it surprises them. Oftentimes the ego is such that they think they've somehow bested you. And if you know that you're dealing with someone who, I think the business term is prick, you know, when you're dealing with someone like that, 
that they aren't even thinking of what the actual dollars are. Yeah. They're just thinking of beating you and getting an advantage. Mm-hmm. So I'm not exactly sure what birthed that story. Well, but- I think the whole point here is that you had done two sales before the idea actually went yes. out. First of all, you had to sell Jeff on it. You sold Jeff That's on right. it, and then you sold Lloyd. And I would say that the first sale was necessary to get the second sale. Absolutely. No, I think that's such a critical insight that you need to have the confidence when you are there yeah. to present the idea. And if you're not sold on it, you're already at a huge disadvantage. Yeah. No, you're right. And that, by the way, we still haven't gotten to what I want us to get to. I mean, you're a storyteller and I saw the documentary. I, you know, have seen the complete play in workshop form and I met Lloyd, you know, and we had some background in common that we were both drafted into the U.S. Army. We both went to South Korea. We both actually were in the same unit. I was just 10 years later than he was. He was closer to being killed, which I think was part of the drama of his being drafted right at the height of his rock and roll career, that there was certain people who didn't like this particular type of entertainer being right as successful as he was. And that's part of the story that comes out in the video that you created, but also in the theatrical production. But the big thing here is that I have a rule. I've broken it so many times earlier in my career that the pain of not sticking to this rule is immediately available to me whenever I'm tempted to do it. And that is I never try to sell anybody on something that I'm not sold on. Right. Mm-hmm. In other words, I'm sold and somebody's going to write me a check for this. I just don't know if it's you. Right. And that's so true. And that concept of the double sale is so great. You never hear a phrase quite that way. You hear, well, you have to have confidence in all of that. But it's really about you need to be sold on your ideas because what really comes across, I think, is one's passion for what they're doing. And passion is seductive. Yeah. You know, it relates to a lot of different situations in life, not just the entrepreneurial marketplace. We've always, you know, right from the beginning, hired probably the average when people join us, they're in their early 20s or mid 20s when they join us. And over the years, you know, they may have a boyfriend, they may have a girlfriend, you know, but they aren't married. And then, you know, you'll have couples who are together for a long time, they might be together for 10 years, and you see them at all the social events, you know, but they're not married. And so I said, you're living together as if you're married, but you're not married. And they said, yeah, well, you know, it's the same. And I said, I want to tell you, it's not the same. I want to tell you, it's not the same. And we just had one who's been about eight, nine years, and they have two children. And they just got married uh, about two weeks ago. And I told her, it was in this case, it was a woman who worked for us. And I said, I want to tell you that when you're married, it's really different. She said, well, it can't be. I mean, she says, it's the same. And I said, you'll notice. And I got a note from her. And it's been about a month now. And she said, I can't tell you how big a difference it makes to actually be married. So we had a chance to talk about it. And I said, what you've said is that there's no alternative. It makes all the difference in the world when you say there's no alternative. Mm -hmm. Then you're 100% in. As long as there's a possibility of an alternative, you're not in. Yeah, it's an interesting comparison. Yeah, but it's a sale. You know, I mean, to a certain extent, it's a sale. I mean, you've sold yourself, you know, on a particular relationship, on a particular future and the other person picks up on it. Everybody picks up on it. So for those who were starting off or for those who are struggling with how they should value themselves in terms of what they're selling. So we've established and it's critical. You need to, their first sale is yourself. Mm-hmm. And how much do you need to look at the spectrum of the marketplace? In order, you know, here's a high end, here's the lower end, but they're all kind of doing the same thing. You know, how do you establish that price beyond the cost of goods and materials, et cetera, et cetera? 
so that you can get a premium for your efforts, no matter what they are. Well, what's the first sale that's needed? I mean, that's actually going to involve money. You know, I mean, in your case with selling yourself, well, that's an emotional, intellectual commitment. And the same thing with Lloyd, that was a creative commitment that you actually put pen to paper. You know, you actually created a sample of what it would look like if it was in theatrical form. We've got there. Now let's talk about, let's take one of your students at the new school. What's the first money? Are they looking for investment? Are they looking for, you know, are they looking for a contract? Are they looking for a project? What are they looking for? So let's say that they are looking for a job and they, you know, are looking to learn from that job to eventually start their own business. Okay. So they're not an entrepreneur yet. They're in an employment situation. Right. And in what they think is also a critical learning thing, you know, the yeah. old learning on somebody else's dime, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. You told me a very interesting story about one of your speakers. And for those of you who are not familiar, but Jeff just has a great program at the new school in New York, and he brings in really, really incredibly successful owners, CEOs, entrepreneurs, marketers, and everything. And they'll say, you know, if any of you want to talk to me about a career and what I do, here's my contact information. And if you call me, you know, we'll talk about what you're thinking about. And it's a rare beast when it actually happens, isn't it, Jeff? Yeah. And you're raising such an important point, which is that I think you always have to be opportunity focused. And that doesn't mean you have to be starting your own business. But when you have someone like that who is offering to help, offering to lend you their ear, who knows what that could lead to? Yeah. But it is amazing because a lot of people are still intimidated at the thought of doing it. What am I going to say to them? And by the way, the other side of that spectrum are the people, and I get these calls where you really seem interesting. I'd really like to pick your brain. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's something that vultures do, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I don't want yeah. my brain picked, you know. Yeah. When I first started coaching, which was 1974, I won't get into it, but I, I got off to a good start because I, you know, hit the right type of person in the right industry and it was financial services and it was life insurance at that time. And life insurance is, is a very binary industry. You're either really great at it or you're terrible. There, there isn't much in between with life insurance. So I had as a first customer in this 1974, uh, somebody who was really a legend in the business. He was a Scot. I think he came from Edinburgh, lived in Canada, and he was a bigger than life type of character. And But he was very scattered, you know, as many entrepreneurs are. He was interested in everything and it was hard for him to focus on one thing. You know, I have a good way of conversing with people to kind of keep them on what they want and focus them. But he had a very interesting little plaque right behind his desk. I remember it and he said, if you master what's in these four lines, he said, it's better than a Harvard degree. And what it said, Jeff, was if you would sell what John Smith buys, you must see through John Smith's eyes. And he said, I have to tell you how hard that is because we see through our own eyes. But the big thing is that if you're just starting, it means you're ignorant. Yeah. And what does someone who would buy what I'm thinking about, how do they actually look at things? How do they actually see the world? If someone were to write me a check for, employment, if somebody were to hire me, how are they seeing the situation so I can understand what their checkoff boxes are, that they're getting a good deal by hiring me? Well, and I think what you're talking about, which is also critical, is a certain sense of empathy. You know, what are their needs? What are they looking for? And if they are going to pay me to do X, why? What is the either problem they're trying to solve, yep. you know, whatever it is, because if you're only talking from one side of the table with no understanding of the other, I think that there's a pretty good chance you're not going to complete the transaction. Yeah. 
And so I think that you're right. You do have to view that. What are they looking for? What do they want? Don't just walk into a situation knowing what you want to get out of it. You really have to look, as you said, through their eyes, you know, what's important to them. Yeah. Because you know, how else do you establish a meaningful dialogue about it? Mm -hmm. I mean, people do things for their reasons, not your reasons. Right. That's so, right. You know, what are their reasons? I mean, why are they even hiring right now? Why would they even be interested? Are they expanding their business? You know, are they trying to free up their own time? What's the game plan from their standpoint? I was at a dinner in Cod's country, and there was this 18-year-old who's just starting college. So I sat down with her, and I started talking. And I didn't have to contribute anything for an hour and a half. She just talked and talked and talked and talked and talked. And she was talking about this and talking about that and talking about this. And she had very strong views on many things, got a lot of opinions. I said, I wonder what it's going to take in the years ahead for I understand that it's actually about questions. It's not about statements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of the things that I suggest to my students is interview is a two-way street. So don't you sit there and just be interviewed. Ask questions, engage in conversation, because if they don't feel the engagement, you know, they don't want to just listen to you bleat, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so I think that you're right in questions, sensible questions, not the kind that you look up, like, what are the best 10 questions to ask on an interview? What are you genuinely curious about? You know, and I think that that engagement is huge. So I completely agree with you. You know what I would do? I mean, if I'm sitting in Jeff's class and an offer, you know, like that comes to me, I would follow through and said, you know, you were in Jeff Madoff's new school class and you very kindly put out that if I was interested, I could come in and talk to you and I'd like to set up. Okay, so I would do that and I come in. Then the first thing that I would ask, and I'm telling you this with the benefit of about 60 years behind me of doing wrong things. So <laughs> anyway, I would start off and I'd say, can I ask you a question? This thing you've created, how did it start? How did you get started? And I would just ask the person how they got started. Like Kathy Ireland, we had the great pleasure of being there at Kathy Ireland. And she just got a fascinating story, you know, fascinating stories. You know, she grew up near Santa Barbara. She was the first in the area, first girl who was ever a paper boy, but not only a paper boy, but the best paper boy. And she was just walking on the beach and a talent scout from the fashion industry just came up to her and said, you know, there's something about you that I think is really great. And she ended up, you know, as the tomboy model for, you know, next 15 years, whatever it was, and then went out on her own. But my sense is that if you started there and simply asked the person how they created what they created, you'll immediately know so much about that person just of why they stuck with it. And you could ask them, you know, was there ever a point where it just seemed too difficult to you that you couldn't do it? I mean, if somebody who was 18 or 19 years old asked you that, Jeff, how long would you give them to talk to if they just asked you questions about how, you know, I was at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and then I started my own, came out of it, and I started my own clothing company, my own fashion design company and everything like that. I mean, how much time would you give a person who just asked you about how you created what you created? Well, you're correct. It would be engaging. And the part that would be most engaging to me is that they're demonstrating curiosity. Well, not only that, they're demonstrating to me why they're going to be valuable for exactly. me. Exactly. That's right. That's right. And I kind of put that all under the same umbrella. Yeah. That if you are engaged and you're curious, then you're the kind of person that I want. Yeah. And, you know, the number of people, I will say the students, so how many of you responded? For the listeners, that background, that's just a New York sound effect. <laughs> that's right. And I close the window, too. <laughs> But, you know, I think that it's really important to demonstrate that interest, yeah. to demonstrate that curiosity, because that's all very seductive. But it's the thing it takes first is taking the initiative to contact that person and take them up on their offer. 
And you start off by showing some gratitude for the fact that, you know, I was in the class, I was fascinated by what you were saying. And I'd really like to take you up on your offer and talk to you about it, like you said. And so many people don't do that because they're intimidated or they're just afraid or lazy. But whatever the reason is, usually there's an intimidation factor there. That's a missed opportunity. And so many of the students who have followed up have ended up getting a job as a result of it. And one of the things that really makes me feel fulfilled is when a student will write to me three years later and say how this changed the direction of her life. And she did that. And that's really cool. I asked also, so I asked the, on the first day of class, how many of you consider yourselves to be a salesperson? What's interesting is over the years, and this is not scientific, yeah. but more and more realize that they are salespeople, you know, because you have to be. You have to sell yourself, if nothing else. Yeah. So what we're telling people in terms of how to value themselves is that they have to sell themselves on their value. They have to be aware of what else is out there, right? So that they aren't crazy in what they're asking for. And they have to have some reason for why whatever it is they're doing costs X. Mm -hmm. You know, and this again is to get traction starting off. You know, when you're hopefully as you become more successful, you can have a, already a reputation that precedes you. So they know you're in a certain arena. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you a story. And I think it has bearing on what we're talking about here. So my initial interest, I was 18 years old. I was in northern Ohio, growing up not too far from where you grew up. I was very interested in theater. So I was going off to Washington, D.C., and I had employment there, but I also went to Catholic University, which was one of the three universities that had great theater school. Uh, Yale was one of them, Northwestern and Chicago was one of them, and Catholic U was one of the, Ed McMahon, who was Johnny Carson's kick, had just left Catholic U there, and uh, there were other people who were prominent in theater and TV and movies that had gone to Catholic U. Anyway, one day I just wrote a letter to someone who had just gotten the biggest theater contract in history on Broadway, and it was Richard Burton in Hamlet. So this would be 1962, 1963. And Richard Burton had become famous because he was dating Elizabeth Taylor he had all the right credentials from the standpoint of being in British theater, but this was Broadway, and Broadway is just totally different from any other theater in the world. But he got a contract, and it was for $1 million, and it was the first time that there was a $1 million theater contract on Broadway. But he had no history on Broadway whatsoever, and it was for not everybody's favorite play, but, you know, doing Hamlet. So I wrote him and I asked him, you know, just two or three questions about how to get started with it. I explained to him. And it's very interesting, the history of Richard Burton. He was Welsh and he actually didn't speak English till he was 16. He grew up speaking Welsh and then he had to learn English. And his name was actually Jenkins, but his speech teachers, who was a very famous voice teacher by the name of Philip Burton, and he took the name for theater purposes, Burton. So I wrote off, you know, probably the typical insignificant letter that an 18-year-old would write. And about a month later, I get a three-page handwritten letter back, okay? And I got to believe it was real, Jeff, because he said, I want to tell you right now, you've got a very fundamental choice that you have to make. And he said, the choice is, do you want to be an actor or do you want to be a star? He said, you have to be clear about that right off the bat. He said, if you want to be an actor, he said, find a really good acting school and learn the basics and do everything they tell you and be an apprentice and then move up. And then there's other training. You can do other training and sort of catch on with companies that take advantage of students who have gone through the school and everything else. And he said, and that's your path. You'll be an actor. And he says, it's it's a profession and you'll move up by your experience and everything. He says, 
That's being an actor. And he said, if you want to be a star, find the smallest local theater group, a church or anything, and go there and be a star. Be the star. And he said, when you outgrow that one, find another one and be the star. He says, but never don't be the star. Always be the star. So he goes through and he explains this. And I found, you know, I'd read books on acting and this three pages were better than anything I'd ever read. And he said, by the way, this is the last paragraph. He says, by the way, I never wanted to be an actor. <laughs> it's interesting. And I think that there's a fundamental thing there too, you know, about when you're just going into the marketplace, you got to be clear about that, you know. Are you going to be one of many? Right. As good as many others, or is there something special that you're really going to go for? Well, one of your phrases is the distinctive difference. And, you know, what is it that you are bringing to the screen or the stage? Or what's the distinctive difference for that product that you're selling or the service that you're offering? Why should people choose you? Yeah. And the other thing, because we started this conversation on pricing, just who you think you are special has a lot to do with your pricing. Mm -hmm. And go into that a bit deeper. Well, take Lloyd Price, for example. Well, Lloyd Price, what's the price? <laughs> pricing. But I'm a big fan of early 1950s rock and roll music. And I have to tell you, I listened to you know, our streaming service, you know, where they put everything together. Pandora? Pandora, yeah, I listened to Pandora. And boy, I listened and I said, God, there was some great music, great musicians back then. Boy, there were great voices back there. And you look it up, never knew them, never knew them. I mean, when Lloyd Price came along, there was a lot of talent coming into the marketplace all over America because this talent had been completely neglected forever because it was black. Right. Okay. But every community had a place that developed people's voices, developed their music and everything that was called a church, you know, and you had church, 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 thousands of churches that were knocking out talent, but there was no marketplace for them. And the way you write the story on Lloyd, it wasn't because, you know, some local promoter got a hold of him. It was two people from Hollywood who came and saw him. And they gave him his first chance, you know. And, you know, I mean, just think about the beginning of the story, you know, in New Orleans and in a bar, basically in a bar restaurant where it started and everything like that. But I think that he had this notion that he wasn't just anybody. And I think it's part of the script that you aren't anybody, you're, you're somebody. But he also had to understand that he was. And initially, he didn't. No. You know, and of course, most people don't come out with that kind of confidence. And actually, it was the character who's not quite on this side of the law, on the other Logan. side of the law, who really, I think, knew the importance of Lloyd Price. Yeah. Oh, I think that's correct. It's interesting. So through the name of what we do in this yeah. podcast, <laughs> but I think that there's really some valuable takeaways from what we've been talking about. And the interesting thing is, is most valuable takeaways aren't a pricing formula. It's a psychological approach. And that psychological approach is, first of all, you have to sell yourself before you can sell anybody else. And you also have to view the world through the eyes of the person you're trying to sell to. What is it they're looking for? Why are they looking for it? How do you relate to them in a way that is engaging and that can bring you closer to that transaction that ultimately you desire? You know, because as you go on your journey, whether you raise your prices or your values is higher until you value yourself, it's not going to work. At least optimally, it's not going to work. And once you learn more of what that landscape is by viewing the world through the eyes of the person on the other side of the table, that's going to open up a greater possibility for you than if you just go in there trying to sell and be a salesperson. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's really an interesting thing. And the more that you can take in how other people look at the world, the more you get a clearer picture of kind of the unique 
spot where you can enter the picture. Yeah. <laughs> there's a conversation I have with a lot of the technology people. And, you know, there's this thing, you know, if you're going to create something new, think in terms of a billion customers. Okay, think in terms of a billion customers. I said, yeah, yeah. I said, I get the point of the thinking exercise on that. But I said, you know, it may be good for a billion, but does it actually work for one person? That's right. And I've heard so many times from talking to actors and performers that they'll oftentimes lock on somebody in the audience, a person in the audience who is so in the zone with them that that's in a sense who they play to, you know, and it gives them a certain comfort. I always do that. I have five because I want to go from left to right, you know, like a thing, but I have five people and my whole talk is for those five people. And why is that? Well, because they're giving you feedback. Mm -hmm. They're sitting there and they're going like this and they said, wow, You're yeah. right. Like that. And I said, I don't care what the others are doing. <laughs> they're engaged. They're engaged. Yeah. You want engagement. You know, I mean, the more engagement you feel, the more engaged you are. So, yeah, life is very specific. Yeah. And I think it's another thing twofold. One is you have to know your market, but you also have to know your audience. Mm -hmm. And I think that both of those and there's a distinction there and both of those are really important. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because although you didn't pursue a career in theater, you're on stage often, in a sense, it's your, what you do is quite performative. Yeah, yeah. And I realized when I was in my mid-20s that I had to be some part of theater. I couldn't be all of theater. I was probably good enough. You know, I was good enough to probably make it. But I wouldn't have been passionate about what I was doing. But in a certain sense, you know, I've created my own form of theater with the program and I write the scripts, I'm the producer, I'm the designer, I'm the main performer and it spills over into video, it spills over into audio, spills over into books. But it is theater. I mean, so much of life really is theater. You know, there's a front stage, there's a backstage, you know, and you have an audience and one of the greatest payments that you can have is applause. Yeah. Yeah. And as that playwright, maybe our audience has heard of him, Shakespeare, the world is a stage. <laughs> and it's really true. Mm -hmm. And I think that performative aspect is in understanding that is critical. Mm -hmm. And also just really interesting because it takes Stanislavski acting method had to do with understanding the given circumstances. What world am I in? Mm -hmm. Who are these people? What is my economic status? Uh, you know, do I have any kind of a personality quirk? You know, all these things that help define a performance for an actor. And that's the first time where they went into that kind of depth in terms of performance, which has stayed with us ever since. Mm -hmm. And that same criteria exists in business. Mm -hmm. Who is my market? Who's the market for that? That's your audience. You know, who's the market? And, you know, are the ticket prices, can you sell enough to keep the doors open, <laughs> you know, to the theater or to your store or to your law firm or yeah, whatever? Can you put a great team together? Exactly. You know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember, you know, one of my earlier interests was the Swedish director, Igmar Bergman, because he he was the first really non-American filmmaker who really made a big impact on certain audiences in the United States. You know, it started in the late 50s and he you know, went through you know, 20, 25, 30 years, uh, Igmar Bergman. But the interesting thing is he had a company of technicians, a videographer, which was such a big thing back in those days. And if you looked at his production company around the films and then the writer, not so much the writer because he was the writer, but the actors and actresses and actors that stayed with him for many, many films. And it really came home to me that for really talented people to be part of a really talented team, it doesn't really matter as long as you're making a living, how much money you make on it. Well, 
I wish I could take all the credit for putting a great team together for my play. But the reality is, as certain people sort of signed on and became such an important part of it, like the director, Sheldon Epps, who you met, well, these people are magnets for other talented people. You know, nobody knew who I was, but I, fortunately, I got Sheldon to read the script and he really sparked to it. And so then we get a great set designer like David Gallo, who's won numerous Tony Awards and Emmy Awards. Then, of course, the lighting designer, oh, I'd love to work with David Gallo. And, you know, building that team, it's also important to realize it's not just about you. Mm -hmm. It's surrounding yourself with the best talent because that acts as a magnet to get other great talent. And that collaboration can be incredibly satisfying. Well, name another experience in life that surpasses it. There aren't many. You're right. You're right. And we are only at the beginning of that journey. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's funny because when you and Babs and I had lunch a few years ago and, you know, you wanted to get involved in the play. <laughs> and it was funny because I was not expecting that at all. I had no anticipation or anything. And then more began to make sense why it at least initially interested you was, you know, your love of theater. Mm -hmm. And here was an opportunity to not just see the front stage, but the backstage of a process that you've always found interesting. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that, mm -hmm. you know, at that time. I've learned it since. I knew you love theater because we've talked about theater a lot. But, you know, it's just really interesting because you also, there's a lot of serendipity in life. And so often with whether it's conferences we've been at together or whatever, it's like all these people have this plan plans go out the window pretty quick, you know, and you have to be able to recognize opportunity and just the serendipity that happens in life, you know? So it's great to have a plan if you know you can let go of it. Yeah. Yeah. One of the further steps that I'd like to take this particular conversation is I created a small book about a year ago and it had a huge impact. So I, I do these little quarterly books you know, that are one idea books. I'd like to talk about it next time because it comes at everything that we talked about in the previous hour from a different standpoint. And that is that everybody buys into that they're going to have to sell something. They're going to have to sell a product. They're going to have to sell a service. They're going to have to sell themselves. And that's kind of beaten into people from a very young age and they like it or don't like it, or and they think it's a good world or a bad world based on that. And I said, you know, when it comes right down to it, the only proper mindset that you can take to actually get what you want is that you're the buyer, mm -hmm. that you're actually the buyer. So what is it that other people are going to try to sell to you that you actually want? And don't look at yourself from a position that everybody is competing with to be a seller and actually take the reverse position that you're actually the buyer. So maybe we can talk more about that. I would love to, because there's a, I won't give it away. There's a really good story I can tell you about Ralph Lauren. Mm -hmm. That is exactly what you're talking about. So yes, I would love to do that. That's great. Yeah, yeah. We've talked about everything. Now we'll talk about something that's in anything. <laughs> <laughs> and you put it together yeah. and my friend, Dan Sullivan and Jeff Madoff here have just talked about anything and everything. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for joining us today on our show, Anything and Everything. If you enjoyed it, please share it with a friend. For more about me and my work, visit acreativecareer.com and madoffproductions.com. To learn more about Dan and Strategic Coach, visit strategiccoach.com.